team, we're looking at population dynamics in this PowerPoint. Um, so we're going to be looking at how populations can change in number and the factors in the environment that could lead this to happen. So we're on Unit 3, Topic 2, and I think it's PowerPoint 5 that we're up to. So Population Ecology, Chapter 4 of the Pearson Textbook, Section 4.3. So for us, by the end of the lesson, you'll be able to define the term carrying capacity, explain why the carrying capacity of a population is determined by limiting factors, including biotic and abiotic factors, and explain the effects of changing, oh sorry, explain the effect of changes within population limiting factors on carrying capacity of an ecosystem. All right, so in terms of the different factors that can affect population size, we have touched on these a little bit in previous lessons, and this is looking at this within the context of altering how many individuals or different species there might be within an ecosystem. Um, we've talked in the past about availability of space, um, areas for breeding, nutrient availability if we're talking soil and plant growth in particular, water quality if we're talking marine ecosystems. All of those different factors are going to have some effect and influence on how many individuals are in a population. Uh, we need to understand those influences in order to have any type of analysis on the growth and distribution of organisms within an ecosystem. For example, with the images on the right from Pearson 4.3.1, you can see larger populations like the penguin colonies could have many, many hundreds to thousands of penguins in them, whereas we can have endangered species like the, um, the orange-bellied orange parrot there on the right, which um, is heavily endangered. So we can look at some of the different factors that might be limiting the population there for the parrot compared to larger colonies like the penguins. So when we're talking about a limiting factor, this is going to be any factor that's going to limit the population size. So in terms of all of the different things that you could think of that might influence a the distribution of a species, there's heaps of things we can think of. We can think about um, the nutrient levels, the amount of space, shelter, all of those sorts of things. But the limiting factor is the one that is going to negatively impact the population growth because it's not present in as large a quantity as the others. Um, so, for example, you, you might need food, water, shelter, nutrients and light in a particular ecosystem. If all of those are available except for water, then water is the limiting factor in that ecosystem. And in the image on the right there, figure 4.3.4, this would be typical of a drought environment where water is limited and so therefore the distribution of animals or numbers of species would be limited there. Now, in terms of limiting factors, you need to be able to describe these in a sense of biotic or the living components of an ecosystem and abiotic, non-living components. So first we'll touch on the biotic ones. And going back to the example of the endangered parrots there on the left, um, a biotic example of a limiting factor might be the presence of predators. And obviously predators are going to restrict populations of organisms from exponential growth growing out of control. I'm in reverse, so growing out of control. Um, and keeping population numbers in check. That normally happens within ecosystems. An abiotic limiting factor might be a shortage of nesting sites for these parrots. Perhaps there's been some deforestation going on, some clearing of trees, maybe an extreme weather event, and therefore a shortage of nesting sites has led to a drop in numbers there. So that would be abiotic non-living factor. All right, now in terms of these limiting factors, these can be described as either density dependent or density independent. Density dependent is referring to a larger impact being observed in a population that's more dense. So the larger the population, the, the more magnitude that effect would have on a population. And this is quite typical, especially when we're thinking about biotic factors. Um, because we have to factor in things like competition for resources, food, mates, nesting areas, and things like that. 
So the density dependent ones are the ones that have an effect on population size and density, but the magnitude is greater depending on the density. Um, the effects that these density dependent factors have would be expected to increase as the population size increases. So with the example there on the right of the penguins, you would expect there to be a larger effect with such a dense population if we have competition for food, for space. A smaller population, these factors wouldn't be so extreme. Um, they would affect birth rates and death rates within a population. So density dependent factors, we're going to go through some of these separately now. The first being competition, because thinking about large crowded populations, competition is always going to be one that would come up first. That could be for food, water, shelter, mates, nesting areas, and so forth. And remember, we've talked in the past about competition in terms of interspecific and intraspecific. Interspecific is talking about competition between different species. And often this isn't as extreme because the needs of different species wouldn't be exactly the same. There's always going to be some difference. There might be some overlap but we wouldn't expect there to be an exact um, matching of those two species and what they require in the ecosystem. Intraspecific competition is where individuals of one species are competing. And this is a little bit more extreme because they're going to be after the same things. So in a highly dense population, that competition is going to become more extreme. Um, over there on the right, you've got the, I think it's Kapukan monkeys, and they, they have a hierarchical social structure in their ecosystem, which means that the, the top dog gets the, the pick of the, the territory and the ones that are lower down in the hierarchy miss out, which means that the, the top of the hierarchy, they're going to get the food, um, the, the weakest ones are going to die in that environment. So they're very territorial animals, and that's an example of intraspecific competition. Um, and again, the more dense that the population is, the more effect that that's going to have. Another example is with young. So in the image on the right, figure 4.3.7, animals that have large litters or a large number of offspring, they're all going to be competing as well. And often we find that with animals, the weakest ones aren't going to be able to get to the food and then unfortunately probably not going to survive. Um, and that relates back to our R and K reproductive strategies, remembering that the R species that have a lot of babies, they typically require less care, um, which kind of relates now to this density dependent idea. Another density dependent factor would be predation. And thinking about this in terms of the density of individuals in a population, if we suddenly increase the density of prey species, um, for example, in the image here, the, the um, hare on the right, then the predator, which is going to be the lynx, would have more access to the food source. So we would expect that the population of the lynx would increase. Now, if we increase the lynx population, all of a sudden the intraspecific competition is going to rise as well. And the lynxes are going to be competing for all of a sudden these hares that will start to decrease in size. So we'd see that the hair numbers would decrease and a greater intraspecific competition is going to happen with the lynxes. Um, and so we kind of see a correlation there between the numbers of these, which we can see in the next slide. So we can see here there's a figure where we've got the prey, the hair, shown in the blue, and we've got the predator, the lynxes, shown in the purple colour there. It's a little bit up and down as you expect in a normal population over time for different reasons. But you can kind of see a little bit of a correlation there where over time the prey population decreases as a result of predation. So we should see that the blue line is decreasing at certain points. But whenever you see a decrease in the blue line, it tends to be followed by a decrease in the pink purple line for the reasons that I described before that it rise in intraspecific competition. Okay, another density dependent factor is crowding. So the higher the density, the more impact of the competition for resources. 
thinking about animals, thinking even about plants and being able to spread roots and take up a space in an area, the more crowding there is, the more competition for that sort of space. Uh, parasitism, thinking about organisms where you've got um, the risk of parasites trying to take over a host. The more dense a population is, the more chance of the parasite being able to take on a host and invade the host and possibly spread among the, um, the species. This idea relates very closely to infectious disease, relevantly enough right now with coronavirus, where if you think about people, if we have a large dense population, then infectious diseases spread more rapidly. That means that unfortunately, the denser the population, the more likely it is that these infectious pathogens can be spread among a population. In communities where there is less individuals and less a much larger spread of individuals, we wouldn't expect to see so much happening in terms of spread of infectious agents. Okay, now we've got now density independent factors and I've made a typo here in the first line that should say density independent, I need to fix that. Um, so these factors are ones that impact a population regardless of the size of the population. So it's going to have the same effect whether we're talking really dense or very sparse environment. Um, so some examples of that would include natural disasters, bushfires, cyclones, floods, droughts. Um, Changes in temperature and humidity, that's going to affect a community regardless of the size. Sunlight availability, soil and water pH, salinity, so salt concentration, wind, water availability. These sorts of things will have an impact on the ecosystem regardless of its density. Now this brings us to the idea of a tolerance range. And we have mentioned this in previous lessons where every species has a particular range of conditions which it can live in and that's called its tolerance range. Now for every idea that I've mentioned, all of those factors that we just went through, there's an ideal range that's going to be favourable on an ecosystem or a species within an ecosystem. Um, and that's going to affect their survival, their development and the numbers that we see in these species. Outside of that optimum range, we would expect to see stress appearing in that species. So in the figure on the right from Pearson, figure 4.3.14, you can see in this green area here, we've got the optimum tolerance range. And on our y-axis, we've got population size. And our x-axis is looking at an environmental gradient. So that's just referring to a change in a particular factor. So it could be light, it could be water availability for plants, it could be any of those examples. This is kind of an idealised hypothetical of how these, these tolerance limits should work. We can see that organisms are most abundant when they're, um, when they're within their optimum tolerance range in the green zone here. You can see that fitness and growth is maximum so organisms that are within this range are going to be doing quite well and thriving in their ecosystems. Now if we think about up here in Cairns, the Great Barrier Reef for example, this could be when the water quality is good, water temperature isn't too high and the corals are able to thrive and do really well. Now in this stress zone which is most like what's happening right now with global warming, we might have the water temperature increasing and the quality of that water declining and so that would be considered a stress zone and we see that the red line here is going to be decreasing the population size is decreasing and that's because we're outside the range that the organism can tolerate if that continues to a point where the organism just can't survive within those limits then that's called the zone of intolerance and that's why we see an absence of organisms and that can lead to extinction and things like that um, in a variety of circumstances. Okay, now this is an example out of Pearson. We've got um, effect of soil salinity on canola emergence. So we're looking at salt concentration within the soil and the growth of canola. On the y-axis, we've got emergence and survival percentage. So the higher that is, the better they're doing and the days after seedlings, sorry, after seeding, 
so how long after we have planted the seeds. It's always good to analyse what's on the X and Y before we start to look at these graphs. All right, now having a look, these different lines are representing different salt levels. So the red line here is looking at a low concentration of salt. And we can see that with low concentrations, we're getting an earlier increase here in emergence of the seeds. So the seeds are happening a little bit quicker and we see a very rapid increase in emergence and survival. And we're reaching 100% a little bit earlier there so the lower concentration is going to be the most effective for these seeds that's closely followed by the second one where the salt levels increased um, it follows a very similar trend to the red line however you can see with this blue line where concentration is at its highest it takes a lot longer for the seeds to actually start to appear and then once they do appear we can see that it's taking a lot longer for the seeds to start to um, grow and they don't reach 100% survival. The best that they do is about 90% and then it starts to decline after that. So they're not actually surviving at all. They're reaching a point and then dropping off. Um, so over to the right here, I've put in this little box that we can see that canola can tolerate low levels of salinity, but at high levels, seed and survival are severely impacted. And that's, that's common because most plants don't tend to like highly saline soils unless they're specifically adapted to that, like mangroves, for example. Okay, and this brings me to the last term for the PowerPoint, which is carrying capacity. And this is an important definition which the QCAA would like you to know. And carrying capacity is the size of the population that can be supported indefinitely on the available resources and services of that ecosystem. Now, in the absence of a limiting factor, whether it be biotic or abiotic, this means that the population growth would be exponential. We'd expect that it would follow that curve that I mentioned before. It'll keep going up, starting off, and then just grow, 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 and keep on going because there's no limiting factor. They just keep reproducing and it would go crazy. In the real world, however, we do have these um, limiting factors. There's going to be things where we're going to not have enough of them in an ecosystem for everything to survive. And we should expect that the births and deaths would cancel each other out. And when that happens, that means that the species has reached the carrying capacity. Now on the PowerPoint, there's a video here that you can click on and have a watch in your own time on this. Whoops. So from this lesson, hopefully now you can define carrying capacity. You can explain why the carrying capacity is determined by these limiting factors and give examples of biotic and abiotic. And hopefully you can explain the effect of changes within population limiting factors on carrying capacity by using some of those examples that we looked at throughout the PowerPoint. Now the syllabus has a few guidance notes there. There's a, in the glossary, there's a definition of carrying capacity. Um, there's some examples here of limiting factors that should be discussed, and we've talked about those throughout the PowerPoint. And there's some suggested practicals there that could be looked at possibly for a student experiment. Now, in Pearson Year 12 Biology, page 188, questions 3, 4, and 5, I would like you to look at at some point, and we'll discuss those in class.